So I'm here, Susanna Kasha. Most of you know me. And there's also my colleague, Anouk. Could you put your camera on, Anouk? So that people can see you just for a second. Yes, there you are. This is my colleague who's working from home. Um, the others are in, we others are in the office. And we have, um, let me introduce you to the speakers today, Pernilla Hansen. Can I have you introduce yourself and wave? Oh, that's lovely. Please wave. That's good. And Elena, could you put your camera on? And, and ah, this is Elena from Kyrgyzstan. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. And we have um, Randy, who is from Portuguese. There you are. Yes. Hello, everyone. Yes, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. OK, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's really great to be here. If you could all mute yourselves except me right now, I think that's probably the best idea. Um, it's really great to be here, and I'm excited to talk to you about remote psychological first aid. Um, I know that a lot of you on this call already know what psychological first aid is, and many of you probably work with it, but there may be some of you who are not so familiar with it. So the very first thing we're going to do is a very small activity. Um, I would like to ask all of you to quietly reflect on a time in your life where you felt distressed, but where somebody helped you. Um, you may have received some difficult news or experienced or witnessed something frightening or some other uh, events or experience led you to feeling distressed. I want you to think about the help that the person gave you and to think in particular about what was it that they did when you felt distressed? What was it they did that helped you? What was it about their action or about their behavior? Was it that they listened to you while you were talking or Perhaps they let you cry or they held your hand. Um, so if you could just take 30 seconds to think about a time where you were distressed and where somebody helped you. And you could share, in, if any of you feel comfortable sharing in the chat, just one or two words about what it was about the other person's behavior that was helpful in that situation. And then I'll ask Anouk if you can just, when people start sharing, perhaps read one or two examples. So I don't want you to focus on what it was that distressed you, but rather on what it was about someone else's um, behavior that was helpful to you. Salah is sharing listening without judgment. Mm -hmm. And I encourage others, thank you. Anouk, maybe you can read up a few more examples. Yes. Nah Nahid is sharing, they gave me the required space and made sure they knew they loved me anyway. And Victoria is sharing, spoke and acted in a calm way. And Meng Chin is sharing, let me cry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other examples? Not yet. Just listening some music from Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. And Anne is sharing, listening, and no advice. And Salah, again, is sharing, give some practical help. Okay, super. Thank you so much. Um, most of you have first-hand experiences of psychological first aid, either that you received psychological first aid from someone else, or you helped someone, and you didn't know that what you were doing was actually psychological first aid. Um, there is not one set way of providing psychological first aid. It's very similar to physical first aid in that it's a set of skills that you can learn so that you can be better equipped to help someone else who's in distress. Um, and how you do that depends very much on the situation, uh, what the person needs, but it also depends on your ability, your knowledge, your own skills. Um, for example, if a girlfriend calls you in distress because she's found out that her husband is cheating on her, uh, compared to if you're walking in the street and see someone who's about to jump off a bridge, you will use very different 
um, actions and you may behave very differently in those two different situations, but you will be using your psychological first aid skills in those different situations. So um, there are a number of different approaches to psychological first aid that are being used around the world, um, but they're all based on the five principles of psychosocial support in emergencies that um, were developed by Hopfall and his colleagues, which, were, which are about um, promoting safety, a feeling of calm, a sense of connectedness with others, promoting self and collective efficacy, and promoting hope. The PS Center uh, and many national Red Cross and Red Crescent societies um, use the approach that has been recommended by WHO, and uh, that is based on the three action principles of look, so listen, great. and link. And most of you know those. Um, before the PS Center was following a slightly different approach, and we went back to this approach because it's really easy and simple to remember. Please remember to mute yourselves if you're, if you're unmuted. So each of those action principles has a set of actions, like, for example, here the actions for the action principle look. Um, look involves gathering information, um, finding out who needs help, checking for safety and security, physical injuries, immediate basic and practical needs, and emotional reactions. Um, listen is especially about communication, how Manila, you Manila, can I, yeah. Manila, can I ask you to move the, you're a bit far away from the camera, so you need to move the paper a bit closer to the camera so people yeah. can see. Thank you. Okay, and I will, we'll actually also look at these later. So yeah. I'm just showing that, um, so there are a number of different actions that are connected to each action principle. And uh, they're all equally important when you provide PFA, but you may not just do all of them because of course it depends on the situation. Uh, however, there are some that are critical and that we always employ as helpers. And those are of course initially checking for safety and security um, and checking if the person we're talking to has any physical injuries. Um, right, so those are, that's a very quick and brief introduction to psychological first aid. An easy way to remember what it is, is really to think of it's what we do when we help someone who's in distress. So, um, of course, the beginning of the year, we were all affected by the COVID-19 outbreak, and this has led to global distress. There are millions of people around the world that are affected by this um, pandemic, and it has led to, to it had, has had so many impacts that have led to heightened levels of distress all over the world, which um, has called for uh, also developing new ways of providing psychological first aid remotely, because we, of course, all are encouraged to practice um, physical distancing. So at the PS Center, we had already, um, last year, we finished developing some new training materials and reference materials in psychological first aid. When COVID-19 happened, uh, we got together and looked at how we could develop some training materials that can be um, used very fast in different countries and can support people to learn skills on how to provide psychological first aid remotely. Um, I'm just going to now share my screen. I can do that. I'm still viewing the PS Center screen here. Yeah, but you have, uh, yeah. it says that you, I'm remotely controlled, so if you share yours, you should be able. Okay. It says, otherwise you, yeah. Yeah, now I'm you're controlling sure. my screen. You're controlling oh, my screen. I don't. Ah, okay. I you don't want to control your screen. I want to control right, my own right. screen. Yes, that's that's the issue. Okay, so I have to give you. Oh, sorry. No, oh, maybe um, new share. Maybe you could send me the. You can share it um, by next to the chat. It says share screen, Penella, and there you can. Below, not above. Um, 
So next to, next if you move your mouse below, it says participants chat, share screen in green. If you move your mouse to the bottom of the screen. Yeah, but the PS, we can't, we can't look at two different screens at the same time. The PS center needs to stop sharing, I think. No, you just take over. Take over. Well. Okay, yeah, I just stop sharing. Ah, there we go. Great, sorry. Uh, good. No, that's fine. Okay, great. So, um, we've developed uh, these new PFA for COVID materials. They're based on the materials that the PS Center developed. Um, some of you may be familiar with these. And they're also based on the latest guidelines from uh, WHO and from the IASC um, Standing Committee and of course from the PS Center. Um, the training that we have developed include a basic training, which uh, is on basic PFA skills, which can either take about two hours or three hours, depending on how you do the training. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. And then there are four shorter additional modules. Uh, one is on remote supportive communication, where you go into more in-depth uh, learning about that and practice. Um, right. The next one, oh, let me go back. The next one is on caring for staff and volunteers remotely. Uh, the third one is on psychological first aid for children in the COVID-19 response. And the last module is specifically on how to support people that are dealing with loss and grief. So um, I just want to explain to you a little about these new materials because we have developed them in a way that any national society should be able to pick them up very easily um, and adapt them and translate them from English into any other language. Basically, they consist of a set of PowerPoints that, uh, as you can see here, a set of PowerPoint slides with speaker notes. Um, and then they are also accompanied by small videos and a worksheet that participants do while they're taking part in the training. Um, the trainings can either be held in an online live training in a platform like the one we're on today with Zoom, or they can be uh, created into a recording so that participants who are not perhaps in some countries, they may not have good internet or they don't have time to join the online training, then they can watch a recorded version of the training where they can still participate in activities by stopping the video, completing the activities, going back to the video and so on. Um, I'm just going to briefly tell you a bit about what happens in, uh, right. so in the training, you learn about how uh, the COVID-19 virus has impacted people and what their reactions are. As I mentioned, you also take part in little activities. This is how an activity is for the recorded version, um, where you're just asked to pause the video and list key groups of people that, that are more at risk. If it's the online version, you may be put into groups and asked to discuss and list key groups in, in small breakout rooms. Um, the participants learn how to help with the different uh, platforms that we're using today in the COVID-19 response. And as I mentioned, they learn about loop, listen and link. In each of the different uh, action principle learnings, there are little exercises or activities. For example, there's one on identifying common or severe reactions. Um, all of the action principles are also considered specifically in the context of the challenges that people are facing because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in the listen, they learn about um, calm and controlled breathing. They take part in a little activity. And in link, uh, they learn to address different issues also around accessing um, information, such as looking at rumors and false information. There's also in all of the training focus on how to prepare to provide support, support remotely um, and different aspects also of providing care to staff and volunteers. So these training materials that we've developed are of course 
um, supplemented by all the information that you can get from different sites. And we also have created some little podcasts on different uh, topics, such as remote PFA or a podcast on caring for staff and volunteers and on calming someone in distress. Okay, so this was just an example of the PowerPoint. I'm just going to show you briefly also how the video works. Uh, this is just, um, and the video is now a recording of the training, and it also holds um, a little example of how I've integrated the videos that demonstrate PFA skills into the recording. So I'm just going to play this for um, about two minutes and check that you can all. Additional help. Examples of severe reactions or situations that call for immediate attention and referral include if you encounter a person who's been unable to sleep for a week or more and seems confused and disorientated, if the person is unable to function normally and care for themselves or their family, for example, they've stopped eating or cooking for their family, they're unable to keep clean, if the person has lost control over their behavior and has become unpredictable or destructive, if they threaten to harm themselves or others, if the person starts excessive or out of the ordinary use of drugs or alcohol. Some people show severe reactions in complicated situations, for example, if someone presents with chronic health conditions which need specialized support, or if there are symptoms of a mental health disorder. If a person presents with any of these signs or symptoms, the helper should assist the person in distress, access additional help as soon as possible. Watch what happened in my conversation with Nozipo, where she shares that she hasn't been able to sleep for a few weeks. Yeah, we can only hear the audio, we don't I'm see also the not video. sleeping well because I'm sitting up. Hi Anouk, you don't see the video? No, we hear the audio, but we don't see the video. We see the PowerPoint. Oh, yeah, the PowerPoint. Yeah, the video is coming now. The PowerPoint, that is part of the video. It's the recording of the PowerPoint. Okay, sorry. I was just wanted to clarify because there was a lot you of know, questions. You know, thinking all the time and, and uh, I know that ultimately affects, you know, my mental health and, and even just physically not being able to eat and sleep is... It's just yeah. taking its toll on me. I just feel so exhausted. I, I was even thinking it might be an idea to just even admit myself to the hospital so they can give me bed rest. Let's talk a little bit more about the sleep. How long, how long have you not been sleeping well for? Gosh, I don't even know. I think the last two, three weeks, I would say, I haven't had a decent night's sleep. And um... Okay. Uh, that was just an example to show you. Um, and the reason that you thought you were not seeing the video was that the PowerPoint presentation that actually was the video. So what I did was I recorded myself presenting the PowerPoint presentation and then integrated the little videos along the way as demonstrations um, of psychological first aid. Because in this method of training, we're obviously, it's quite difficult to demonstrate with the uh, volunteers in an online setting like this. Okay, I think that that's it from me, just in terms of presenting what psychological first aid is, and also in terms of presenting uh, the materials that we've developed that um, you should be able to pick up and use really easily. Back to you, Ia. Or Anouk. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you so much for presenting the new material. So we just wanted all of you to have an idea of how you can use it. And if you're not Red Cross, you're also welcome to use it. It's for free download. Everything we produce is for free. You can download it. There's, um, so so that, that's, that material is absolutely there for you. Um, I would like to, and to pass over to the next presenter because we have Penilla back. And Elena will now take over, and I will then have to get the controls. And there's Elena. There's uh, Elena from Kyrgyz Red Crescent. But I also have some PowerPoints. So now, do you want me to put on the PowerPoints, or do you want to start speaking, Elena? How do you prefer? You can start to share them. Yes, I will do that. Yes, um, I just need to get my 
my control and then here we have them and I need to get the control back so I will go to zoom and you can begin speaking when I fumble with the controls we're all learning zoom as we we are paving the road as we are driving so let me find that share screen and I need to share the, this one I am sharing my screen can you all see it yeah Good. we can brilliant thank you That's thank you yeah maybe just put it in present mode uh, yeah present mode oh yes of course sorry apologies yeah i was sleeping i will um just go on i'll just get it on sorry yeah i need to get it on <sighs> goodness here we go <laughs> present this is why we should be many people. Yep, go on, Alina, <laughs> floor is yes, yours. Thank you, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Alina from our Kyrgyzstan Red Crescent Society, and I would like to present our experience uh, during uh, COVID-19, uh, how we reach our uh, PFA models and uh, which challenges we faced. So could you please share with the next uh, slide here? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, uh, a little bit about uh, our country context. Uh, so you can see uh, that uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, on the map, uh, it's uh, the country which located in Central Asia and, um, and don't have any access to the sea. Uh, and uh, we are a small country and uh, has a uh, border with Kazakhstan, China, Tajikistan, and uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, 90, uh, uh, 80 by uh, mountains, and we have seven territory units, which we uh, have also our branches of uh, Red Crescent Society. And the uh, population... Sorry, um, Melina, I think we lost you. Can you hear us? I think we have lost the connection. Um, I will just, Elina. So we have lost Elina and um, Randy, are you I ready? I'm here. Okay, I'm good. Here. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, please. It's my internet connection. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. So okay, go on, uh, please. Yeah, you can move the slide, please. And uh, what we do during the uh, pandemic, uh, and uh, of course, a little bit about our capacity uh, from this year, uh, about a little bit of uh, HR capacity. Uh, from this year, we uh, started to hire uh, psychologists, but we couldn't find uh, a good uh, a candidate. Uh, that's why we uh, requested from ICRC in our country to second it, uh, their uh, psychologists to us for help us uh, for surviving from a uh, pandemic. Uh, we also have seven uh, trainers and uh, NDRT team also uh, trained by uh, PFA and uh, we have uh, trained volunteers in each uh, branches. Uh, also we have a little uh, PSS stocks uh, from this year. We have a totally um, 200 uh, sets uh, of uh, PSS boxes. Uh, it's uh, just uh, like uh, simple stationary uh, items for children. Uh, we have PSS backpacks for our NDRT team. And uh, from UNICEF, we received uh, early uh, childhood development and recreation kits, which we also used during uh, pandemic uh, uh, situation. Please move. Yeah, uh, what we do as uh, PFA, also remote for staff and volunteers, we uh, started uh, uh, one time, uh, uh, twice in a month, we uh, organize uh, online meeting with our PSS focal points in each uh, branches, where they share their feelings, uh, their challenges, uh, and uh, general uh, mood of uh, team and um, uh, our uh, psychologist she present uh, presents for us uh, uh, different uh, topics uh, which we requested from her uh, for example uh, ground uh, system uh, team building center uh, uh, how we can provide pfa uh, remotely uh, by phone uh, we uh, did a, a 
Lego session in HQ, and uh, we also provided uh, PSS boxes. Mm -hmm. so you can see on the slide, uh, balls and table games for each of our branches with uh, support uh, letters from our senior management staff. You can see also the photo on the slide. Uh, and uh, besides our senior management uh, every day uh, uh, posted uh, different um, messages in WhatsApp group for our uh, branches, uh, which uh, responds actively in uh, uh, province level. And uh, we started uh, post uh, different, uh, uh, like um, uh, our staff with different background uh, in uh, uh, Facebook and in Instagram as uh, hashtag red team, which also has a good uh, positive uh, feedbacks from our staff that they feel that uh, they did uh, more and they feel uh, support from uh, our um, uh, so from our uh, director general. So uh, what else? Uh, Besides, uh, we uh, are going to translate uh, uh, EAC book, uh, You Are My Here in Kyrgyz language and distribute among our staff uh, because uh, they uh, um, spend a lot of time uh, in their work and uh, uh, don't spend many time with their families. Uh, that's why we decided to uh, spread uh, this book uh, among our staff. And also we are going to translate a children activity card for helping them uh, to uh, conduct time with uh, their children. Could you please uh, switch off your phone because it's like disturbing me. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, could you please move for the next slide? Yeah, uh, what we do uh, also on the front line, uh, we, uh, our team on branches and also in HQ decided to uh, do like PFA for our uh, medical staff uh, who are work with uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, people. Uh, and uh, uh, for now we have uh, uh, 372 uh, medical staff which has uh, COVID-19 status. And uh, we uh, provided uh, with them sweets and paper flowers as uh, supporting them and uh, make uh, their feelings uh, better. And uh, they, um, uh, haven't visit, uh, visited their families for a long time. That's why we decided to support their family members and provide them with uh, uh, PSS uh, box, uh, which include, you can see on the slide, uh, different color, coloring books, uh, table games, uh, sport items. And uh, uh, besides, in addition, uh, we uh, Part, our hostel as observation for medical who has uh, um, negative status of COVID, but they should be uh, two weeks uh, in this uh, place. And um, yeah, we uh, provide them with like a remote PFA as we share with uh, contacts of uh, connection for keeping in touch with their families uh, from there. So yeah, and supportive messages uh, from our uh, volunteers. So we uh, uh, say to them that uh, thank you for uh, for your father, for your mother uh, in our uh, country. Uh, 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 please next slide. I hope you can hear me um, good because I just uh, any time uh, read that internet connection is not good. Most of the time it's fine, Elena. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Thank and, you. Yeah. Yes. And uh, also we have. Uh, uh, oh, well, my time is over. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Elena, yeah, sorry, uh, our, I was muted. Uh, you can go uh, on, of course, you can finish. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I can finish. Okay, yeah, and um, we have a lot of challenges uh, starting from uh, curfew and uh, seasonal uh, disasters and emergencies which we faced uh, any time in our country. You can see on the slide, yeah, also. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>
and and be before we leave you, Elena, you will be back and you will answer questions in the end. But I think there was a few questions, Anouk, that you followed up on. Could you please? And I, Anouk, also give the Harry Potter story, please. The Harry Potter? Ah, yes. <laughs> I will do that later. Uh, the, the questions uh, we've received so far, uh, one was for Penilla, uh, but let me start with the question for um, Elena. Uh, which was from Hazim. Uh, can you please elaborate more on what is included in the recreational kits? Uh, recreation kits, uh, uh, it's just a standard uh, package of UNICEF where they put uh, any sportive uh, uh, items, uh, tables, uh, uniform uh, for playing games, uh, uh, bowling and uh, etc. stuff. Thank you. And another you question was for Penilla, but maybe we can do that later in the Q&A. Yeah. Uh, and, and then you said that you were going to do the um, translate into Kyrgyz language, the, uh, the You Are My Hero book. And Anouk, please inform yes. everybody, the audience of the facts. Well, the Interagency Standing Committee has uh, written a book, which is called uh, My Hero Is You, which is a children's book on COVID-19, where um, and we are part of the Interagency Standing Committee and co-chairing it as well. Um, and now this children's book are, is in the top 20 of most translated books of all time, and it has been translated more often than Harry Potter uh, in, I think, up to now 102 different languages. In, uh, and it's the quickest ever uh, translated document in uh, about six weeks. It was translated in about 102 languages. Thank you. That's yeah. amazing. And if you are going to translate on your own uh, languages, you should uh, receive permission to uh, permission to do it. So yeah. we just uh, recently received it. Brilliant. And and what are the messages? If I may ask you, the Secretary General sent messages every day in a WhatsApp group to all the regions. What was he writing about? Did you hear me, Elena? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Messages to for medical staff or for or for. You said staff. that the Secretary General sent out messages on a daily basis on WhatsApp. So what did he write about? Just take care or sleep well. Or... Yeah, just uh, take care uh, and uh, please uh, use your um, PPA and uh, keep distance. Uh, just remind uh, the uh, n norms of. Uh, COVID-19 and uh, of course uh, they anytime um, uh, write uh, thank you for uh, for your doing we uh, appreciate it and uh, etc yeah yes. thank and, you uh, I, I, um, I know that uh, he uh, every week uh, firstly in the first months uh, he make a Skype with uh, directors branch directors uh, we also remind them that uh, they are the best, the hero of our country, and etc. Well, thank you. That's very nice to hear. <laughs> so, Elena, we will keep you. Um, thank you very much, and get back to you. And interesting to see the pictures. And I also know that you have been intervening in the border conflict, where there's cross-border fights, where you actually go in and provide psychological first aid. You used to do that. I've heard you speak about that before. That was really amazing work. So let us go on. And we will have the next presenter. We will have Randy from Portuguese uh, Red Cross. And Randy, I will stop. Uh, do you have anything to share? We didn't discuss that because um, you just we were just informed that you would come on. So Randy, are you ready to go on? Yes. Can you hear Perfect. me? Perfect. Yeah. Yes, we yes. hear you. Oh, there you okay. are. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, Congratulations to Pernil for the, the presentation and to Elena for the work in uh, Kyrgyzstan. Um, my name is Randy. Uh, I'm from the Portuguese Red Cross. Uh, I'm representing my colleague Inês Ribeiro, which is our uh, national coordinator for mental health and psychosocial support. And a special greeting for my colleagues from Portugal who are connected, uh, Anna, Marina and Sonia. Um, we are very glad for uh, this opportunity to, to share some of our Portuguese Red work, uh, work in this response to COVID-19. Um, over the years, um, we have gained some, some experience in responding to emergencies 
or even natural disasters uh, like uh, wildfires or even uh, cyclone. Uh, we were in the response to the Ibai cyclone in Mozambique last year. But um, responding to COVID-19 is proving to be extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily challenging. Um, here in Portugal, uh, we uh, had created a task force for the psychosocial and mental health support to respond to COVID, the COVID outbreak. <clears throat> this task force has and still has the, the proposed to work closely with our network of local branches, our staff and volunteers, to empower them to work with their communities. And um, since March, uh, we uh, we designed uh, this task force, designed the uh, psychosocial and mental health action plan, uh, where the uh, psychological first aid has an important place. Um, it's true that we are uh, used to apply psychological first aid in, in person on site, but doing it uh, in the circumstance of this pandemic is very, very, very different. It's a big challenge. Um, the uh, IFRC PS Center document about uh, remote PFA during COVID-19 outbreak was a very useful tool. Um, one of the, our first actions, uh, still in March, was uh, train our uh, psychosocial teams across the country in remote PFA, uh, be online or with uh, webinar sessions. Then, we, uh, with uh, 16 volunteers, we created a national hotline specifically for the Portuguese Red Cross staff and volunteers. In addition, uh, 53 hotlines were created in the local branches to respond to the, the communities. And also, uh, the, the Portuguese Red Cross uh, trained our other uh, Portuguese NGOs, some city councils, and even uh, a network of uh, funeral agencies. We trained them in remote PFA. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Portugal, uh, in the first months of the, the outbreak, uh, I would say that the proliferation of hotlines was very large. We have um, hotlines for education about COVID-19, psychological hotlines, psychosocial hotlines, social hotlines. There were hotlines everywhere and still the police. But uh, concerning uh, the Portuguese Red Cross uh, hotlines, we received uh, in these three last months uh, 4,222 calls. And we can uh, we can categorize the, the needs of the, the people who call us, who call the Portuguese Red Line of Lines, in um, need for uh, emotional stabilization, um, the need for uh, supplies like food, and then link them to that support, um, the need for uh, medication also, also especially the, the elderly, uh, and also we link them to that support, for instance, with help of our volunteers. Uh, and here the youth volunteers were a very, uh, a very, uh, very helpful uh, group. Um, and the, uh, these volunteers uh, were taking the medication to this person. Uh, we also have some situations in which the people sought medical information about COVID-19. Uh, which we referred to other hotlines, more medical hotlines. Um, one of the things that uh, we, uh, we paid uh, very uh, attention uh, when training both Portuguese Red Cross teams or other uh, uh, NGOs was the, uh, the importance of ensuring that the, the hotline team, teams the, the members of that, that teams were uh, large enough to prevent overload uh, or, for instance, um, to, to have uh, rest periods or to respect the, uh, the shift hours, especially in the case of the hotlines 
uh, that were 24 hours uh, attending the, the calls. Um, in, uh, in some cases, we created also a, a monitoring system for these teams in which each member uh, were contacted weekly to respond a burnout screening or to know about their self-care uh, actions. Um, from the, the feedback uh, from our, our colleagues, um, I, I could say that the, the main challenge is in, in applying remote PFA, which is very different from applying them on, on site. And from the, this feedback from, from our colleagues, uh, the use of non-verbal skills on the phone was challenging. Uh, also, uh, some colleagues also um, uh, uh, shared that the, the, the managing of the duration of the call uh, was sometimes a very difficult task. Uh, some calls could have two minutes, other calls one hour, more than an hour. Um, uh, other other uh, challenging was uh, in the cases where it was needed some grounding uh, techniques on the phone, uh, applying them on the phone is very different from on the on site. Uh, and also uh, in the cases of the need for a follow-up, it was also a, a challenging uh, reported by our colleagues. And at the moment, uh, in Portugal, the statistics, the, the numbers of the, the, viru, the virus uh, are already decreasing, in a decreasing trend, uh, fortunately. Uh, so the, the population are returning to the, the possible norm normality in the routine, uh, still maintaining some of the preventive measures, so, such as the use of mask or, the masks and the physical distance. Anyway, I believe that the remote PFA will continue in this context of the, the COVID, will continue to be a useful tool for the, a few more, more months. Um, this was the Portuguese Red Cross experience that we wanted to, to share with you. I hope that in some way it can be helpful for, for another colleagues. Um, thank you to all the colleagues who have been creating the materials and the, the translation. And, and thank you all, I'm glad to answer some questions. If, if you need. Thank you. So first of all, Handy, let me thank you very much for that presentation where you talked about how you set it up and, and, and we learned about the needs and that was really interesting because there's so much we can learn for, for future um, use and also about the challenges. And um, there will be time for you later for questions. So we will, you will stay with us and, and take questions from the floor. Anouk is following up on the chat. So we will go on to Penelope, uh, who will talk about some of the challenges and maybe also ask you questions during her presentation. So uh, over to you, Penelope, and thank you once more, Andy. Really good. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Ea, and thank you very much, Randy, and both and uh, Elina also for your presentations. It's really helpful to hear about how um, how the PFA is being used in the different countries and what some of the challenges are. And Randy, you already uh, amplified a lot of the challenges that some people are, are facing. Um, I think the biggest, and you highlighted that yourself also, the biggest challenge is perhaps that uh, we have to learn new communication skills. Uh, we can't uh, communicate in the way that we used to where we can observe things and where we can use our body and our mimicking uh, to interact with people in the same way when we're providing help remotely. Um, so I would say that the, the key issue with remote PFA, the key difference perhaps, lies in the preparation. Um, you of course are using the same PFA skills that you would in a face-to-face, -face, but the preparation is quite different because you obviously are using perhaps uh, phone calls or using computers, so you have to check your equipment. Um, you also have to make sure that you have, uh, that you are trained in, in, in the new communication skills that you need to provide remote PFA. You have to also make sure that you have contact with supervise, your supervisor or referral mechanisms so you can very quickly and easily make referrals. Um, 
So I would say in terms of new communication skills, there are, uh, I think it takes extra training in, in listening skills because um, when you're providing PFA over remote, you have to learn how to um, recognize signs and symptoms of distress uh, without using your eyes. So you have to learn to listen to someone's tone of voice or perhaps their speech, whether they're speaking very slowly or very fast or they're speaking muffled. So you have to learn to pick up on, on signs of distress through listening. You also rely perhaps more on asking good questions because you can't see things. You have to ask questions, for example, about safety and security. So you might ask a question like, um, uh, are you in a safe place right now? Are you in a place where you feel comfortable and safe to talk to me? You have to ask questions about uh, physical injury or medical conditions, all of those things that usually you would be able to see if you were with a person who was in distress. You now have to instead think critically and, and use questions to get that information. I think it also takes some preparation in terms of structuring a conversation. And Randy, I think that was interesting. You shared that one challenge is when people perhaps talk for a whole hour, but structuring the conversation and, and planning with the person that you're speaking with, um, I have 15 minutes to talk to you, and this is what's going to happen during those 15 minutes. We'll talk about um, we'll talk about your your problems. We'll look at what possible solutions there are, and in the end, I'll help to link you to to help elsewhere. Um, in terms of the cha other challenges that I've heard people share is of course that it also can be upsetting just like any normal interaction of PFA can be upsetting because it's sometimes difficult to work with people who are in distress but in a remote conversation um, you perhaps uh, may feel a little more helpless in terms of if, if the other person is having a reaction or behaving in a way that, that uh, is difficult to manage, it's even more difficult to do it remotely. Um, also, the person may cut you off uh, in the middle of a conversation. Maybe they cut you off and then you don't know uh, what's happening to them. So there is a whole other level of vulnerability that's in between you and the person in distress um, when we provide support remotely and for that reason it's so important to be trained and have the skills that you need and also to have a supervisor that you can call to, um, immediately after an interaction and say you know this situation really worries me I need help um, I think those are some of the key things that I picked up but I would like to hear also from Elena or, or Randy if there are any other challenges that perhaps um, you've identified or from anyone else in the audience that there are other challenges that you've uh, noticed when you're working remotely um, and some tips that you want to share with the rest of us that would be great. There are some comments in the chat box that I could uh, read out loud if not. Uh, mm -hmm. Kuhn from the Belgian Red Cross is saying some personal tips invest in a good micro or headset and take your time. And mm -hmm. Ahed is asking, Panita, please provide this list of added required skills, asking good questions, etc. as a handout. It's directly relevant. Okay, I can say that a lot of those skills are actually part of the training. So a lot of those come into the training. So if you are able to take part in the training that I introduced earlier, the basic one, and then especially the one on remote supportive communication, a lot of it is uh, in the training materials. And Penelope Just say that we are publishing the remote PFA module. So um, if you look at it right now, maybe you will find it, not find it until next week when we put up the rest mm -hmm. of the modules, but they will be there. This is Ia speaking from yeah. PS Center. Yeah, um, and the modules will be there. Uh, for those of you who joined a bit late, I can see more people have uh, joined. The module, the training modules are both available for you to use them and adapt them, or you can, uh, watch the recording of the training um but they of course are only in english i think at this point we're open for more q a there was one more question from armida who was asking uh, before while when was presenting 
who is responsible to operate or man the hotlines? Is it volunteers or Red Cross staff? I don't think, I think that depends very much on the National Society and, and it would, perhaps we can hear from, from Randy what, who it is in Portugal, but it would, from my perspective, it would have to be people that are trained. So, Yes, uh, we had some, um, some scenarios where the, the staff uh, had the, the helpline and others were volunteers. Um, in, uh, in the either uh, cases, we uh, also tried to have the, the team that answers the, the calls and uh, other things that uh, Pranil was talking about that uh, try to have always the supervisor one supervisor connected to the hotline. But in some cases we have volunteers, in the other cases we have the staff, the staff um, uh, and uh, whatever possible with the supervisor, uh, which, uh, which gives a lot of uh, a sense of safety for the, the colleagues who are answering the, the phone and uh, especially dealing with some difficult uh, call that we may have. Um, but uh, um, taking some of the things that Pernilla was saying also, the preparation for the, the, the attending the calls is very, very important. Have all the, the numbers you may need, all the, <coughs> the, the checking of the equipment also, and the, the challenging of um, uh, developing our listening skills without the visual cues. It's a, a very challenging task, uh, I would say, uh, because uh, we, we don't have other source of information. Uh, it, it's the, the voice of the, the, the people. Um, and uh, one of the, the challenges also that our, some of our colleagues uh, share with us was when the, the, the the, the person needed some stabilization, was very anxious, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, the grounding techniques was <laughs> very difficult to apply over the, the phone. Uh, I don't know if Pernil can give us some, some clues or some uh, techniques that we can explore over the, the phone, but it was one of the, our uh, most challenging identified by our colleagues. Okay. Um, thanks so much for that, Randy. In the basic training, there is, um, there is a small activity where uh, I lead a breathing exercise, but it's there so that participants can practice leading that uh, breathing exercise during a call. Um, so that's, that's one addition. Um, there was another question I wanted to respond to and, and Penilla maybe also mention the podcast on calming techniques and there's another grounding in the next one that you have coming up please talk about that yeah in the small additional module again the one on remote supportive communication we have a uh, telephone call between a helper and a person who's really in distress and you can listen to that and you can hear how the helper um, calms her and listens to her and also takes us through a breathing exercise. Um, that's a really great little podcast. We also have a short demonstration of a grounding technique for when someone feels like they are losing touch with reality. So how to help to stabilize them in that way. Um, so a lot of this is in the training material. So I really encourage you from next week to go and, and try and look through it all and see if some of it can and meet your needs. It's quite a lot of questions um, coming in. Uh, do you want me to name a few? Yeah, I just, the first one that I saw, uh, Anouk, about the internet connection, I just wanted to say yes. that's the reason why we've given the option of either you can do it online, in live, or you can record it and make it into a, a YouTube video. So the YouTube videos were for the people who have bad internet connection and can't take part in online training, they instead can just view the training as a video on, on YouTube. Great, and there's ahead, a, some uh, tips going that. into the chat, so I'll name a few. Kun is sharing some more tips. And, uh, well, you already shared the good micro ads and take your time. And then he shared mm -hmm. another tip. 
we have trained the volunteers and, and their supervisors have clear shifts be limited in time. Um, there was more tips also from Patricia Messina from ICRC. Be simple, be short, be extra patient. Uh, empower your network in the field first. Find extra tips to create confidence between you and the people in front of you. Plan a little time more than usually in your interaction. For training online, create binomial or groups to let them to have space to share together. And then some questions that maybe I can address as well. Um, I had this asking, how is this basic training provided? How can we enroll in it, please? Well, I think you have covered that already, but maybe you want to share it one more time for people coming in late. Okay. Um, couldn't we do um, that in the uh, end? Because uh, then people who were on time, uh, their time is not wasted. And, and Anouk take some other questions. Uh, Lucy is asking, can you tell some skills to support children, especially? Yeah. Uh, for sure, we can talk a bit about PFA for children. Um, this is perhaps one of the most challenging uh, situations that, that uh, responders will find because um, our communication with children re relies so much on our behavior and interaction with them. Um, so in this time of COVID, um, we are even more than before dependent on communicating with children and their caregivers. Um, in fact, for some situations with children, it might be better to talk with the caregivers and give them some skills on how to manage the day-to-day -day challenges that they're having with children, um, instead of you trying to do that through remote communication, because children, even more than adults, may find it difficult to trust someone that they've never seen or that they've never heard their voice before than to suddenly be speaking to someone over the phone. So one aspect is for sure that we should rely more on caregivers or older siblings or others that are around to support the child. Um, other than that, I think the tips that have been given already about speaking softly and calmly, um, about taking your time uh, with children, perhaps, we need more time in the initial part of the conversation to build rapport, to perhaps uh, talk about some lighter things, to create that connection and trust between you and the child. Then, of course, there are the issues around child protection. And I'm sure that all of you know that there also have been uh, rises in domestic violence and issues, um, and that, of course, involves close connection with uh, protective services for children in the countries that you're working. So again, that goes back to the preparation. When you're preparing to give remote support, and you're also preparing to give remote support to children, you as a helper need to be really well versed on what the protocols are if you have a call with a child who reports that they're being hurt or that they're going through some form of abuse. Um, so I would say if your, your uh, beneficiaries in remote support include children, you need to add that extra aspect of child protective services and communicating with children into your training. And uh, because it could lead you into trouble if you don't know what all those uh, protocol and situations are. Great. There's another question from Maureen. Um, do you think we could organize language groups and see how it is possible to make the remote PFA training available for same language national societies who are a small national society with French speaking and we would like to avoid double work in translating? Maybe Aya, um, can you reply to that question? Yeah, um, some of our materials are translated. Unfortunately, getting funding for translations is sometimes a big issue and we haven't had that for, for the modules and it's quite a lot. Uh, whereas the, um, some of the other uh, manuals are being translated, that goes for the material on loss and grief, uh, supportive supervision, um, and some of the others. They will come out in the four main languages of the Federation. And for those of you on the call who are not Federation, that is English, French, Spanish, and Arabic. However, the PFA um, online is already out um, or will be, it, it, it is up um, on, in Arabic. Whether we have um, manpower or women power to translate the next, the additional modules, we are not sure of. But if 
should you wish to translate, you can contact us so that we can maybe get uh, groups of national societies together who could do it. Um, the way we have done it with Portuguese is that there has been a basic Portuguese translation and then versions into Portuguese, Portuguese and Brazilian. So they have had really excellent collaboration on that. So thank you also to Randy for your team on that. So that's as much as I can say now, but brilliant suggestion. Um, Penela, there was also the, the uh, uh, no, Randy, can I ask you, um, how, when, when you had all these issues about stabilization and, and calming, uh, when, when it was found difficult to do that uh, on the course, what did you do? How did you train the volunteers? Okay, we try, um, uh, I think um, it's uh, the, the, the challenge was not uh, so much in my opinion. Um, because of the number of situations who, uh, where it was needed uh, stabilization, but probably is one of the most um, uh, scary things to, to have someone in the other side of the line uh, with um, some uh, need for stabilization. Uh, one of the techniques we were uh, using uh, in the three or train our our volunteers and stuff was in breathing techniques, uh, as uh, Pernil was saying. Um, for instance, other one was uh, trying to uh, to 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 bring the, the the person to the here and now, uh, asking them to uh, tell us what the the person was seeing what she was uh, listening, for instance, if the person was uh, talking in the living room, what were the, the, the things that she was seeing? Or if there was a window, what the, the person saw through the window uh, in the, the, with the objective of uh, bringing the, the focus of the, the person to the here or now, uh, that is the, the the, the objective of the, the grounding techniques. So I think it's uh, it's more uh, a preoccupation. Uh, um, uh, uh, I would say it's more a thing of the, if the situation occur and how the uh, volunteers and stuff will handle it, um, then the actual number of situations where we could uh, we had to, to apply these these techniques. Thank you, that was very clear. Thank you very much. Panilla, comments? Sorry. Um, no, I think that was really explained really well. Thank you so much, Randy. Anouk, could we have some more questions from the... There's not a lot more questions. There is uh, Kuhn from Belgium Cross is uh, sharing one more tip. Loom? is a nice tool to do recorded presentations users slow down or speed up the presentation so that's a tool we that we're not familiar with but uh, happy to find out more um, and i was wondering maybe if there are more participants on the call who have organized uh, a remote pfa or hotlines in there and if they could uh, also jump in with more suggestions or tips or challenges that they faced go on and, I thought, and look perhaps uh, it would be going back to the PFA for children, perhaps it would be especially nice to hear from anyone working with remote PFA for children, if anyone could share some of the experiences maybe that they've had with that. So the question is out. Does anybody have uh, any experience with that? Kuhn, you have so much experience in Belgium. What do you say? Nobody's really jumping in. Ah, somebody has. Yeah, talk. Yes, please. Um, well, um, we do not have special trainings for children, um, but we have children calling our hotline. Um, so we use the same. Um, five elements so we check first if they are safe um, or they alone at home uh, 
um, what is the situation with the parents, etc. We we listen and often they're worried uh, and they are worried um, but don't want to tell their parents for some reason. So um, I do. Um, if they are safe, if they are not in any danger, abuse or something others, it's actually quite fun to do. Um, and we refer them to uh, the national station. We are very lucky we have a good uh, children channel where they have uh, also a website where they uh, inform children um, in a very uh, respectful way, but very clear, very honest. Uh, and this is most of the time how, how it works. We, it doesn't happen that often. Uh, and we treat them as uh, people that to be respected. <laughs> we just listen and we use the same uh, five elements. Can I, can I add a comment to that, please? Um, I think the, the book that, um, that you talked about earlier, that was developed, the one, My Hero Is You, is really the one we talked about that's been translated into over 100 languages. This book is one that you can also encourage uh, parents to use with children because it encourages children to talk about their emotions and their feelings. Like, as you were saying, Kun, that sometimes children hide those from their family or from their parents because perhaps they don't want to worry them but the book is a really great tool for normalizing difficult feelings and encouraging children to talk about them so it's a tool actually that you can use for communicating with children and we can add that um, the module is coming out from Pernilla's side on on PFA for children also we have the activity cards um, that are already out that can be used with caregivers and children and, and older siblings and younger, younger siblings. And you can see them on our website. Plus what we have coming out um, based on something that was developed in Denmark, it's adapted for international use by another delegate for, for the PS Center um, that will be released soon is sessions for children to do or for caregivers, no, not for caregivers, sorry, teachers, club leaders, uh, youth volunteers, anybody when children have to come back into their activities or school again. And they are tailored to three different age groups. So there's also, like Pernilla said, they um, go into dealing with emotions and how you can talk about them, how you can recognize them, which is also in the activity cards because this is really important. So over. Yes, uh, some really good questions coming in. Uh, Rebecca Horn, who we know very well, obviously, having researched quite a lot on PFA, is asking, usually PFA training involves a lot of skills practice, role plays, and so on. What are the effects of being unable to do this? Do you think that remote PFA training can only be effective for people who already have the basic listening and communication skills? Um, I'll try to answer that. <laughs> it's... I don't know what the effects are because we obviously haven't uh, we haven't studied whether the one kind of training works uh, better than the other. But I do worry about that. Uh, do of course worry because one of the most important things about all trainings is about practice and about doing role plays and actually really feeling the techniques. Um, but that we have tried to make the um, we've tried to make the training as interactive as possible. And we do recommend in the, if you are able to do the trainings online and you're able to use a platform like, like Zoom, where you're able to break people into small breakout rooms, that then you can actually still do role plays. And we have in the basic training given some uh, suggestions for ways that you can do that. Uh, and also some examples of scripts from Niger, Niger Red Cross, uh, some small like, um, case scenarios and you can still do that over the um, online platforms but for sure it's not as good as it would be uh, face to face so and your second question about whether I think it's or whether we think it's only effective for people who already have basic listening and communication skills 
I don't think so. I think that people who perhaps even don't have those skills can still learn about the skills in the training. Um, and that's why it's really important, if possible, that people also have the demonstration videos. So uh, we, of course, also encourage that when you're adapting and translating the trainings that you make your own videos um, in, your, in your own languages, if possible, because those demonstration videos really uh, are the only thing that we can use at the moment to really show the skills of basic listening and communication. So we're trying, we're doing our best to, in the circumstance. There's a good uh, related question uh, from Charmaine. I have another question. Are there helpful and efficient ways to assess the skills of those who have received remote training? Um, we have not developed a, uh, training skill uh, skill evaluation but for sure we can do, it can be done and perhaps if you take the trainings and you're using them then that would be an idea initially uh, when we first developed the trainings I was actually developing the trainings for a team here in Eswatini and my um, of where I live in Africa and I had thought that a way of assessing skills could be that after people have done the training like for example the recording but then they have to call me and uh, we have to do a role play. And during that role play, I would be able to assess if they were, if they were confident in PFA skills. So perhaps somebody could set something up like that where you, of course, then adapt the evaluation methods as well. There is an interaction also between Kuhn and Rebecca, uh, where Kuhn is saying we are looking into setting up uh, into a setup where three people do an online role play. One is observer that switches off the video. The observer is also the helpline for the helper. Yeah, that's exactly actually what we recommend with the role plays, that there are three people in each group, one person helping, the other one in distress, and the third per person is observing. So one very important question from Daniela that I don't want to miss is, how do you deal with suicide behavior and suicide attempts? Right. Um, Suicide behavior or any threat of harming oneself or harming someone else is included as one of the severe reactions that the helper must make immediate referral for. Um, and I go back to stress what I mentioned earlier that that is part of the preparation for being a PFA helper is ensuring that you have referral information for the different severe reactions that you may encounter and suicide or any threat of harming oneself or harming someone else needs to be included in that. Um, so you, it needs to be in the training. And we, unfortunately, we can't make a generic training on how to respond to suicides because it may differ slightly in every country, but it's a very key important part of the preparation. And here I'd like to add that we actually have very, very, uh, good material coming out on, on suicide during COVID-19 and prevention of it. And it's been reviewed by the, the leading specialists worldwide in the field. So we are sure and confident that it is really um, very good and reliable information. And it's specialists who are working with us who's writing it. So that is out for proofreading right now. So it will, dis it will appear in, in maybe a week or 10 days. So look out for that as well. And maybe, maybe also, Kuhn, could you say a bit about what you did when it comes to m and &E? Because uh, we did a podcast with you where you talk about m and &E. So what are your thoughts about m and &E in this regard? m and &E, monitoring and evaluation. Sorry, switching on to shorthand. Yeah, I'm afraid I don't um, understand the question. Oh, I mean, um, um, how we monitor our volunteers and the well-being of our volunteers. Yeah, and, and yeah. when you, you because you, you have developed this system and you explain it so well, it's a very good podcast and you should all listen to it. Um, but but do you, when you monitor the, um, the well-being of the volunteers, do you get any responses to challenging their finding when they're providing remote PFA, more, to be more precise? Um, actually, we, we kept it very short and we uh, monitor whether they uh, have they feel better privately or as a Red Cross volunteer and whether they considered uh, quitting as a volunteer. 
I mean, they say they are considered quitting as a volunteer last week. Then we go to the open uh, answer. Um, where they can always comment on each question. Uh, and then we check what's going on and we very quickly give them a phone call. As soon as we are worried uh, uh, or we see that somebody felt helpless during uh, their task, it doesn't matter what task it was, we very quickly give them a, a phone call and get in touch with the people. It sounds a lot of work, but actually it isn't, and it's appreciated very much. Um, uh, when I say that it isn't a lot of work, I mean, you have to be prepared, but you can uh, look at the answers you receive and about one into out of 20 people, uh, you have to invest some time in. So it's not overwhelming. Uh, um. And that would ensure that you would find the people like Randy is talking about who are suddenly um, in a conversation where they find that it's very overwhelming and they are being uh, affected by it because somebody um, that they weren't able to calm somebody down or somebody was being very, very exalted on the call. Yeah. So that sounds really great. So I do encourage everybody to, to look into that uh, podcast we have made with, with Kuhn and Sarah Harrison from the PS Center on Monitoring and Evaluation. So we, we are getting to the end. So Anouk, do you have more interesting question that we need to answer by the presenters? Well I thought it's very interesting to see in a European webinar, we have uh, we had 82 <laughs> participants from uh, South Sudan, from Hong Kong, from all over the world, and Hazib from Northeast Asia, or, sorry, Northeast Syria, very, very sorry, uh, is actually saying he has some experience in running um, remote services. So maybe if we have a few minutes for him to share some experiences, or would that be too short? Yeah, just just a brief comment from 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 what was his name again? Hazim. Come on, Hasim, please go on, Hasim, if you can Hi. speak to us. Yeah. Hi. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear uh, you. Um, yes, uh, we we have. Um, I work for DCA uh, in northeast Syria, um, and and uh, we have some experience providing uh, some services in child friendly spaces um, as a remote setting. Um, it was challenging in the beginning, um, but we were able to adapt some of our uh, structured activities um, to be done at home using Zoom, for example. Um, and that was useful um, to keep the children uh, engaged and um, active during this um, restricted movement uh, time. Um, so it was it was um, it was very interesting to see the acceptance from the community and the parents and the children um, towards something like moving moving the activities from uh, the first hand approach in a child friendly space to a more remote setting uh, using Zoom. So now we do some art activities uh, with the children. We do some storytelling using Zoom, um, and and I think it was very useful for the children. Really great. Thank you for sharing. And, and we're coming to the end. And as we had some questions on how you can do the remote training, I just want to let you know that a colleague of ours has done a three day training on what is called PM plus. Um, well, it's longer, but they have done now the first three days and it's done remotely. And what participants are saying after three days is actually um, it is like being in an online, in a, in a uh, face to face training. So that is quite interesting. Anouk and I will also do an online training later this year on psychological support, psychosocial support in emergencies. And we look very much forward to trying that out. So to end the, the webinar, um, let me thank Panilla so much for, for sharing your insight. And I cannot tell you how good the, the material is. Um, you will have um, a chance to look at it at the PS Center website. Elena, do you have a final word? It was so nice you could be with us. Of course, I'm yeah. with you. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for your uh, uh, sharings and uh, experience. And it was really brilliant. And uh, of course, uh, remote PFA, it's really uh, depends on the uh, internet connection in the country. Yeah, it's the main point, uh, especially in the remote areas where we have s maybe problems with electricity, which also mm. depends with internet connection. Yeah, yeah. it's and our even, main challenges. 
Uh, this is a European webinar. You're from European region, but even some t sometimes in, in, in Europe, we don't have good webinar. Uh, we don't have good internet connection. So there was also Randy, would you have a final word? So. Uh, no, just uh, thank you all of you in um, uh, looking to the uh, psychological first aid uh, remotely is definitely a challenge uh, that uh, make us uh, um, readjust our skills mm. in providing psychological first aid, but it's probably one of the, the best tools for have, helping people in the COVID scenario or other scenarios. That was a brilliant remark to end the, the webinar. So thank you so okay. much for that. You gave me the thank perfect you. ending. And let me just um, remind you that on behalf of the European region, we are hosting another webinar with the Despina Konstantinidis, and we will have presentation from Ukraine, and that will be um, on caring for staff and volunteers, and it is in a week from now. So see some of you then, and thank you so much for very active participation, and Anouk for, care, for doing all the, the uh, following what's going on. I'll be doing that next week, and Anouk will be doing the, the moderation. So thank you, and I hope the presenters will stay on and the rest of you will leave so we can have a discussion about how it went and what we can learn and improve for next time. Thank you.